Hi, my name is Michael Trower, an emergency medicine consultant, and this talk is about triple point of care ultrasound for PE. So we'll do a deep dive into every element of how you can use ultrasound for your patients with suspected PE. We'll review all the evidence, and finally, we'll wrap up with some rap music. But let's start with a case. So it's 2 a.m., and one of your junior doctors comes to you for advice. He's just seen a 68-year-old female who's presented with shortness of breath, hypoxia, and tachypnea. He's recently done an ultrasound course, and he's managed to get this view, and he wants your opinion. So this is a peristernal short axis. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. <coughs> so what do you think? Yeah, the RV is massively dilated. And what about the septum? Yeah, there's septal flattening. There's also a trivial pericardial effusion that's probably not relevant. So he asks you, can I thrombolize this lady? What would you say? What else would you want to know about this patient before making that decision? I'll leave that with you and we'll move on to the second case. So it's now 4 a.m. and he comes to you again for advice. This time he's seen a young 27 year old female with no past history who's presented with the same thing, shortness of breath, hypoxia, tachypnea. This time he's got an IVC view. So this is the inferior vena cava here, draining into the right atrium. These are the hepatic veins here, which are quite engorged. So I think you'll agree the IVC is quite distended and there's minimal collapsibility. So you could call this a plethoric IVC. This next view may seem a bit uh, hard to recognize because it's all quite distorted. This is actually the RV up here, crushing the LV below. This is actually a parasternal long axis. You can just see the aortic valve here, left atrium, mitral valve, but this RV is massively distended. And finally, we have an apical four chamber view. So this is the left ventricle here, right ventricle here. RV is bigger than the LV and the septum is being pushed across. So he asks you, now can I thrombolize this lady? Well, Certainly the fact that she's young and healthy means the RV dilation is more likely to be from a PE. So if she was too unstable to go to a CT, then yeah, it might be reasonable to thrombolize her. So I hope those two cases demonstrate how this, the finding of RV dilation really depends on context. In that first case, it may well have been chronic RV dilation. So we needed to know if that patient had any comorbidities. Perhaps they had chronic lung disease and they had chronic RV dilation and core pulmonale. But in this second case, the young healthy patient, given it's a classic history of a PE and she's got RV dilation, there's not many other things that would cause that RV dilation. So if she was too unstable to go to a CT, then yeah, you can go ahead and thrombolize her. But there is more to it than just RV dilation. So over the next half an hour, we'll go through every aspect of how you can use point of care ultrasound to help assess patients with suspected PE. So the term triple pocus has been coined recently and it refers to echo, lung, and DVT. So in terms of echo, I like to divide this into core findings, which are RV dilation, septal flattening, and a plethoric IVC. Then just to keep an eye out for a visible clot and McConnell sign, simple measurements, uh, RV wall thickness and TAPSI, and finally, more advanced Doppler measurements could include pulmonary artery pressure and early systolic notching. But these last two are really more advanced, more technical things that I wouldn't expect to be done routinely by an emergency physician. So let's go through each of these echo findings in turn. So the first of the core findings is RV dilation. So here's a normal apical four chamber with the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And the RV should be 0.6 to one relative to the LV. So 60% of the diameter of the LV. Here's an example of RV dilation. So here the RV is bigger than the LV. So that's a severe RV dilation. And as we said, RV dilation is not specific to a PE. It can occur in lots of other conditions, including chronic pulmonary hypertension. So this subcostal view was taken during a cardiac arrest in the rhythm pulse check 
So here's the RV and here's the LV. So what do you think? Is the RV dilated? Yes, it's definitely bigger than the LV. Is that significant? Is that specific for a PE in the context of an arrest? No, it's not. So Argaard did a study in Denmark where he took 30 pigs, 10 of them he put into an arrest through hypovolemia, 10 through hyperkalemia, and 10 through arrhythmia. And in all 30 pigs, the RV dilated within about 30 seconds of the arrest. So we know from animal models that RV dilation is a common phenomenon in cardiac arrest. It's not specific to PE. So the second of the three core findings is septal flattening. So this is a normal parasternal short axis. So this is the nice round LV and the crescent-shaped RV. Uh, Professor Bob Jarman refers to this view as the pastry view because the LV should look like a donut and the RV like a croissant wrapped around it. So you can see the septum here is nice and convex. Here's another parasternal short axis, but this time that croissant is really bulging and pushing down on this LV. So instead of a nice round donut, the septum here is being flattened. So you can call this the D sign because the LV looks like the letter D rather than the letter O. And here is an example of a plethoric IVC. So the IVC is more than two centimeters in diameter and there's minimal respiratory variation or collapsibility. Okay, so next there's just a couple of things to keep an eye out for. Firstly, a visible clot. So in this video, we can see that there's a sort of sausagey clot that's desperately trying to escape from that right atrium. And in this still image, we can see a saddle embolus just sitting here. This is the pulmonary artery here, dividing into the main pulmonary arteries. And just here at the bifurcation is this saddle embolus. So if you see one of them, that's really a slam dunk. And the second thing to keep an eye out for is McConnell sign. So McConnell sign is where you have RV dysfunction, but sparing of the apex. So in this image, the free wall of the RV is hardly moving, but this apex is moving. It's winking at us, isn't it? So this is supposedly relatively specific for PE. So it was described by McConnell in the 1990s as having a high specificity for PE. Subsequent studies have shown that actually it can occur in other conditions, such as an RV infarct or even chronic pulmonary hypertension. But certainly I think if you have a high pretest probability of PE and you see this, then it's very likely the patient has an acute PE. So next, the two simple measurements. And the first one is RV wall thickness. So if the RV wall is thin, you know any RV dilation must be acute. However, if the RV wall is thick, it could be chronic disease or they could have an acute PE on top of their chronic disease, so you don't know. So the cutoff we use is five millimeters. If the RV is five millimeters or less, this is normal and RV dilation is acute. So take the measurement in a sub xiphoid view during diastole and exclude any trabeculae from your measurement. And the second simple measurement is TAPSI. So TAPSI stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. It's a bit of a mouthful, so just call it TAPSI. And it's measured on M mode. So you put your M mode cursor through the junction of the tricuspid valve and the RV free wall. So that's the annulus. And then you look for movement of that annulus up and down from base of the heart to the apex of the heart over time. So in this M mode image, we can see here's the base of the heart down here and here's the apex up here. And this is the tricuspid annulus. So during systole, it moves up towards the apex, and then during diastole, it moves back down to the base. And if you measure that vertical distance that it's moving from base to apex, that's TAPSI. And that actually gives you a really good idea of RV function. It turns out that actually most of the RV muscle fibers are longitudinal fibers. And so if you measure how well the RV moves from base to apex, that gives you a really good idea of overall RV function. This is as opposed to the LV, where the fibers can be longitudinal, but can also be radial or oblique. 
So TAPSI is a really good and relatively easy to measure marker of RV function. So you should take an average of three readings and uh, 16 millimeters or less is considered bad. TAPSI may also have a role in predicting outcome in PE. Lobo and his colleagues found that a TAPSI of 16 or less means that you're more than four times more likely to die from your PE, and this was statistically significant. So in a patient who already has a confirmed PE, if you find a TAPSI of, say, 10 or 12, perhaps this should trigger you to refer to critical care, even regardless of the troponin or the BNP. Okay, and finally, a couple of Doppler measurements that can be useful. Useful? Useful. Uh, but I should caveat this by saying, if you're not trained in Doppler, then I wouldn't play around this, and I certainly wouldn't be using it for clinical decision-making. It is quite technical, and it's easy to get it a bit wrong. So this is really for people who are interested in advanced echo. So the first one is pulmonary artery pressure. So to measure this, step one is to identify the jet of tricuspid regurg. Then step two is to place your continuous wave Doppler through the regurgitant jet on your color Doppler. And you'll get a spectral waveform like this. So here's a velocity. We can see the peak velocity here is about four meters per second. Then if you apply the modified Bernoulli equation, you can convert the velocity into a pressure. So velocity squared times four plus CVP gives you an estimate of your pulmonary artery systolic pressure. So here the peak velocity is four. So four squared would be 16 times four would be 64 and then you can estimate CVP from the IVC. So if the IVC is plethoric, that's probably about 20. So 64 plus 20 would be 84. And normal is less than about 25. So that would be severely elevated. Alternatively, as a rule of thumb, if the peak velocity here is more than three, that's probably severe pulmonary hypertension. So one other Doppler measurement that I just want to mention is early systolic notching. So there was a paper in 2019 that found if you put your pulse wave just before the pulmonary valve and you see a notch in the spectral waveform, then this is actually very accurate for acute pulmonary embolus. However, they only looked at patients with massive or submassive PE, and they excluded patients with chronic pulmonary hypertension. Also, the scan was performed by relative experts in echo. So there's quite a few caveats to this study, and I don't think this is something that should be a routine part of our assessment of patients with PE. It's more just something to mention that may become more widespread in the future. This is a fantastic website, ultrasoundgel.org. Gel stands for gathering evidence from the literature. And they reviewed the early systolic notching paper and found, indeed, it does seem to be more accurate than McConnell sign or the 60-60 sign However, they noted they excluded patients with chronic pulmonary hypertension. And there's also issues with the external validity of the results. So I think this is really not, not quite ready for prime time, something just to keep an eye on, watch this space. So the second element of triple focus is lung. And the most common finding in lung ultrasound in an acute PE is nothing, normal lungs, A lines. However, you can sometimes see wedge infarcts and occasionally pleural effusions. So here is a wedge infarct. So it's a dark or hypoechoic area that extends down from the pleural line. They're generally between 0.5 and three centimeters in depth. So if it's deeper than that, that should raise the suspicion of a malignancy or a low bar consolidation. So in COVID-19, we see these lesions, which we refer to as subpleural consolidations. And you'll probably notice that they look very similar to the wedge infarcts that you can see in PE. L the latest research suggests that these are actually a form of immunothrombosis. So thrombosis arising in situ rather than embolizing from a distant DVT source. So how can you tell apart a subpleural consolidation in COVID from a wedge infarct in a PE? Well, you can't really, but the other associated signs may give you an idea. So if the patient has 
confluent B lines and plural line irregularity in a sort of patchy bilateral distribution, this would be classic of COVID pneumonitis. And if they also had a fever and no signs of a DVT, you may be happy to put them down to COVID-19. However, we know that COVID causes a prothrombotic state, and so they could have a PE as well. So I think if in doubt, order a CTPA. So those wedge infarcts, as you saw, are quite small and could be easy to miss. So if you are going to scan the lungs looking for them, you need to use a thorough technique, and I'd recommend the lawnmower technique. So this is where you take your probe and you scan all the way along one intercostal space, then you drop down to the next space and go back and so forth. So you're really surveying as much of the lung surface as you can. And the third and final component of the triple focus is DVT. So we'll talk about the protocols, how to identify DVT, feasibility, and governance. So in terms of protocols, there are various protocols ranging from the simplest one, which is a two-point compression, where you compress at the saphenofemoral junction and at the popliteal trifurcation, up to a three-point scan, where you also involve the deep femoral vein, an extended compression scan, where you scan every two centimeters from the inguinal ligament down to the popliteal fossa, or a whole leg scan, where you also scan all these little calf veins as well. So in the context of a patient with a suspected PE, I'd recommend just the two-point compression. We know that clots tend to occur at branching points because this is where you get turbulence. And so if you scan just at the SFJ and at the popliteal trifurcation, you know, these are the highest yield places where you're most likely to pick up a DVT. So you won't 100% rule out a DVT, but you, if there is a DVT there, you're very likely to pick it up and be able to rule in a PE. So how do we scan for DVTs? Well, we use compression. We actually press with the probe to bring the vein walls together to make sure there's no clot within it. So this is a normal DVT scan. So we're pressing with the probe and we're bringing the anterior and posterior walls of the vein together. So here's the anterior wall of the vein and here's the posterior wall. And when we press down with the probe, those two walls come completely together. So we know there's nothing in between. Here's the saphenous vein and here's the femoral artery. And you can see that we're pressing so hard with the probe, we're even compressing the artery there. So we know there's definitely nothing within that vein. And here's an example of a DVT. So as well as not being able to bring the anterior and posterior walls together, we can actually also directly visualize the thrombus within the vein there. So this bright or echogenic mass within the vein is the clot itself. And again, we're pressing hard enough to compress the artery there, but still those walls are not coming together. So the two ways to see a DVT on normal B-mode ultrasound is a visible thrombus, so directly visualizing the DVT itself, and also not being able to compress the vein. So the first point where we compress in the two-point compression technique is the saphenofemoral junction, or the SFJ. So here's the common femoral vein in the middle, with the common femoral artery laterally and the great saphenous vein medially. And this is sometimes referred to as the Mickey Mouse sign. So the vein is the head and the other two structures are his ears. And here's an example of a clot. So we have some thrombus here in Mickey's face and some thrombus also in his left ear. So the second place where we scan in terms of the two point compression technique is the popliteal trifurcation. So here we're scanning from behind the knee. So the most superficial structure here, the structure closest to the probe, is the popliteal vein. So this is the most posterior structure. And then the popliteal artery is deep to that. This is sometimes referred to as like two scoops of ice cream. And here's an example of a clot within the popliteal vein. So within that vanilla scoop of ice cream, we can see this bright echogenic thrombus. So is it feasible for emergency physicians to perform DVT scans? Well, there's been quite a lot of research on this topic, mostly from North America, and the short answer is yes, it is feasible. So emergency physicians with pretty basic training can achieve sensitivities and specificities in the 90s compared to formal radiology scans. So I don't think it's something we should be doing routinely for patients with leg symptoms, but certainly for patients with a suspected PE, we can perform this test pretty accurately. And finally, a few words about 
governance. So ideally save a short video clip of yourself compressing the vein, but alternatively you can use a split screen function. So here is the femoral vein and artery without compression and here with compression. And we can see the walls have not come together despite the compression. And always save in transverse and in long axis. So if you scan someone's leg and say there's no DVT and they come back dead of a PE, then there will be, of course, some medical legal implications. So let's talk a bit about training and supervision. So I trained to scan legs with experts, uh, scanning patients with suspected DVT, but I actually now only use the scan for patients with suspected PE. Where I work, we have a pretty good system for DVT where we can get a scan usually on the same day or the next day. So I don't think it adds a lot for me to be scanning those patients. However, in the group of suspected PE, especially if they're too unstable to go around for any formal imaging, I think being able to do a reasonably accurate two-point compression DVT scan really adds a lot. Also a word on incidental findings. So in this patient, I actually initially thought this was the IVC with some clot within it, but this is actually a massive paraaortic lymph node. So just be aware that there are some false positives and false negatives and a few traps with DVT scanning. So there are loads of different POCUS protocols. A lot of them are for shock. So there's the pump, tank and pipes. There's the rush protocol. There's so many protocols, you can actually make crosswords out of them if you want to. There's the blue protocol for respiratory failure. But the triple POCUS protocol is the only one specifically for patients with suspected PE. And the main paper that was published on the triple POCUS protocol is Nazarian in 2014. It's published in CHEST. So they looked at 350 patients, about a third of whom had a PE on their subsequent CTPA. And they found that triple POCUS had a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 86% for PE. So this is having any one of the three components positive. So either RV dilation or a wedge infarct or a DVT. However, if you just look at the DVT specificity, this was nearly 98%. So if you find a DVT, you can be almost certain that the patient has an acute PE. They also looked at positive likelihood ratios, and echo was actually not very good, only 3.6. But lung, so wedge infarcts, was 15, so very good, and DVT was fantastic, 21.7. So Nazarian also looked at the potential for reducing unnecessary CTPA. So in the 132 patients that had a negative triple pocus plus a clear alternative diagnosis, so for example, pulmonary edema or low bone pneumonia, in none of these patients was there a final diagnosis of PE. Also, 63 patients had a positive DVT. So he argued that you can reduce CTPA use in both of these groups. In the first group, because you've got a clear alternative diagnosis, and in the second group, because you're going to anticoagulate anyway for their DVT. So we found that we can reduce our CTPA use by more than 50%. And if you think about the radiation in the 20-year-old female group, for every 300 CTPAs that we perform, we will cause one extra new malignancy. So this is not insignificant. This paper by Koenig is like a mini version of Nazarian. So it's published in CHEST, the same journal, in the same year as well, 2014. Fewer patients, but they also found that if you have a triple focus that is negative for PE and finds an alternative diagnosis, in all 54 of those patients, CT didn't add anything further. Okay, so let's summarize triple POCUS. So first, echo. So we've got the core findings of RV dilation, septal flattening, and a plethoric IVC. There's a couple of things to keep an eye out for. So a visible clot and McConnell sign. There's a couple of simple measurements that you can do. So RV wall thickness and um, TAPSI. And then optional advanced Doppler measurements. So pulmonary artery pressure and early systolic notching. In terms of the lung, we use the lawn mower technique. And usually the lung will be normal, just with A lines. But you may see wedge infarcts, which are relatively specific to PE, but can also occur in COVID. And finally, DVT. So use the two-point compression technique. It is feasible for emergency physicians to do this scan, 
And if you find a DVT, this is highly specific for a PE. So what is the role of point of care ultrasound in suspected PE? Well, the main role is just making the diagnosis in the group that are too unstable to go to CTPA. If you can rule in a PE in this group, you can thrombolize them and save their lives. Secondly, reducing unnecessary CTPA use. So if your triple focus is negative, plus you find a clear alternative diagnosis, then you can avoid doing a CTPA and save that patient that radiation. And finally, prognosis and disposition. So, as we said, a TAPSI of 16 or less is an independent predictor of mortality and should be taken seriously. Okay, three take-home messages for today. First, a negative triple focus plus an alternative diagnosis may prevent unnecessary CTPA. A TAPSI of 16 or less is an independent predictor of mortality. And DVT is highly specific for PE, almost 98% specific and much more specific than just RV dilation. Here are the references and some resources if you'd like to learn more on this topic. And if you have any questions, please send me an email at this address or tweet before we wrap up with some rap music. So if you don't know this DJ, the EMC, prepare to have your mind blown. So he recorded this as part of the Ultrasound podcast on coreultrasound.com. So just copy this uh, address into your web browser and jump ahead to 23 minutes 50. And it's just a two or three minute wrap, which perfectly summarizes everything we've talked about. Thanks very much for listening.